Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Muddy Waters podcast and YouTube series and a continuation of the Divorce Wars episodes I've been recording. And this is part three, arguably the most important of all. And because it is so important, I'm going to tell you a couple things up front. I don't know how long this episode is going to last. I don't know if there's going to be a part one and part two. It depends on um, how long this goes. I want to be respective of your time, but frankly speaking, the temporary orders phase of the divorce is possibly the single most important of all things that will occur prior to or after the fact. I'm hoping that this episode is reaching you long before the initial filing occurs. In that place you may be, or a friend of yours, or a loved one may be, of considering the fact that this may be heading towards family court, and this may be a situation where we're going to have to go through all the steps to break up our marriage. And especially if there's children involved, it is critical to know what to expect. Imagine, you know, envision a chessboard, and you're starting off with all the pieces lined up as they should be. Knowing what the pawn moves are all the way through the initial check, all the way through checkmate, Knowing all those things, how the board can likely move before entering into any steps in that process, um, it's going to save you heartache, headache, and, you know, help you set realistic expectations along the way. So I wanted to record this episode. I want to tell you that there are actually nine key considerations in preparation and leading up to the temporary orders. And I'm going to go through each of those step by step. It's also important for me to share with you, if you have not engaged an attorney yet, this may be the most critical episode you can listen to. If you have an attorney, this is a good opportunity to match and mirror the advice you're giving them and help them best to help you and explore those things perhaps that we may touch on today that maybe haven't been covered by your attorney and ask them, what about this next phase and how does that work? And let them know that you're being proactive in your case. The best way to get the most out of an attorney, and frankly for the least amount of money, is for you to prepare yourself, for you to become not the expert, but to demonstrate a good understanding of where this whole situation can evolve to and help them to help you uh, to be a good guide to you, to be a good resource to you, to be most effective in how they represent you, your interests, and those interests of your children. So again, thank you for joining me on this episode, and let's take a deep dive. Now, I mentioned to you in the opening that there are really nine steps involved in this temporary hearing buildup. The first of which is financial disclosures. Let's call it discovery because discovery, in addition to financial disclosures, can include facts about the marriage, facts about the children. Yes, affidavits submitted by supporting witnesses on one side or the other. Um, so let's level set on expectations. And this part of the uh, video and the uh, podcast is really going to center in on how the discovery process begins and what the submission of financial affidavits can look like. Let me be straightforward with you about a couple things. First of all, do not hide information. Do not try to find ways to shelter monies and hope that they aren't uncovered. Do not commit any level of misinformation or on the other side of that equation, fraud. Do not do that. If you're going into this alone, um, you have the opportunity <laughs> to be creative. And I would really highly advocate the fact that you shouldn't um, because it's going to come back to bite you. And one of the surest ways to have punitive damages, which can be substantial, levied against you by the court is to lie to the court. Look, you're going to become an open book. Everything about you 
is going to be part of the public record. That's how family court works. That's how divorces work. You might as well embrace that in the onset. All of this is going to go into a thick file that can be accessed into the future. But that being said, if you think for a minute that you've got $10,000 in cash that you could shift over, loan to a friend, whatever, and make it disappear, let me tell you what, the family court does this for a living. Every day they're looking at financial documents. Every day they're using formulas to determine, just like the IRS does, if you're being truthful and honest. Don't think for a minute you're going to pull the wool over their eyes because you're not. <laughs> and it's just not a road you want to go down. So understand that in the discovery process, you're going to have to provide bank statements. You're going to have to provide tax returns. You're going to have to disclose any debts that the family has. You're going to have to provide in, uh, um, statements on the assets and the property that the family currently owns. Um, you're also going to be asked to provide communications and insights into your marriage, your spouse, and if applicable, your children. So let's talk about this for a moment because it's important. You may think to yourself, um, and again, this is more advice uh, for those of you who don't have legal counsel yet. Certainly if you do, your counsel is going to advise you as to what is a good strategy and what things you should avoid. And by all means, listen to them. But let's assume for a minute one of two scenarios. You have legal counsel and you want to ensure that you feel comfortable with the advice that you're getting. This may be a sounding board for you to evaluate that advice. Conversely, you're going in pro se. It means you're representing yourself. And you're thinking to yourself, man, I need to fight. I need to go out to my friends. I need to get them to sign documents, affidavits, sworn, sworn statements that say, you know, she was always yelling and screaming and, um, you know, she was mean to me and she didn't pay attention to the, you know, these sworn affidavits may feel meaningful to you. They may validate what your experience was in the marriage. And the truth is the court likely doesn't care. They're, they, <laughs> it's not their first rodeo. They've seen these affidavits and statements. She was mean. He was neglectful. She did this. He did that. And quite honestly, they give them sometimes very little weight. They assume that your friends are going to stand up for you, that they're going to say the things you want them to. They might even infer that some of these statements are coerced. So they are less important than actual statements from authorities. And what I mean by that, very specifically, is police reports. So if you have an abusive spouse, but you've never reported them, there's never been a police report, you've never, ever taken any steps officially towards addressing that behavior, how in the world are you going to prove that it actually happened? If the children aren't interviewed and there's children involved, and sadly, if there is abuse in that relationship, it's likely not going to come out until after the temporary hearings when the children are interviewed. Now that being said, if there are egregious accusations, um, the court may decide in the temporary hearing um, phase, prior to the temporary hearing phase, I should say, they may decide to interview children. They may sit down with each of you individually at their discretion. And it depends on the nature of the accusations leveled and how seriously the court takes them and how credible the court feels. It's not a guarantee um, that these things will occur. So these affidavits you get signed, you know, may or may not be important to the court, but anything material to the marriage, specifically anything provable about the marriage and the household situation, police reports, school records, school plays attended, parent-teacher meetings attended, homework participated in. All those things you as a parent can show um, that you did with the children. Anything related to the spouse and the spousal situation, emails, text messages, 
that may be relevant to the court to get a good enough understanding of your family situation to interpret that into actionable orders in the temporary hearing, that's really what they're looking for. Um, financial affidavits will include outlines of income. Again, don't hide anything. Expenses, debts, assets. Um, these are used, and let's be very clear about something. You may think to yourself, well, you know, I'm the major breadwinner, be you the husband or wife. You may say to yourself, I might make $100,000 a year. My husband might have been a stay-at-home husband, but I did that so that he could be with the children and the court should reward me somehow. And the realities I shared in a previous episode is there are guidelines and benchmarks that the court uses. It is simply a spreadsheet question. They plug in numbers and they try to equalize households and they determine how long the marriage has lasted, which then in turn, uh, in, in turn uh, dictates how long the alimony will be paid for. Generally speaking, under 10 years is considered a short cause marriage. Uh, alimony lasts for half the length of the marriage, whether it be from wife to husband or husband to wife, doesn't matter. Based on income, based on that <clears throat> methodology of equalization, Child support is determined by household income, normalization, and percent of time spent with the children. So they're going to sort through these financial factors. They're going to plug it into their guidelines and um, spreadsheet, and they're going to come up with a recommended temporary alimony and if appropriate and applicable child support guideline recommendation. And it's purely based on numbers. Um, and unless those numbers change for very good reason, that's what it is. It is what it is. Um, so understand going in the importance of transparency, the importance of accuracy. Don't think for a minute you're going to slip a $10 bill under a doorway and get away with it because that's what the court does is they accurately assess assets and they determine. And don't forget on the other side of the equation is someone you've been married to that you've shared a financial history with. So don't think for a minute that you can slip away a large portion of monies or hide income from someone who once was your loyal supporter and a participant in your financial situation who is now moving into an adversarial role with or without legal counsel. They know about the household finances. So... <laughs> I'm not going to beat a dead horse with this, but um, it's important enough to underscore. Um, now let's move on to phase three, which is critical to understand mediation. I want to spend some time now on mediation. And if you are working with a competent, experienced attorney, it's very likely that they may make a recommendation to you and when we talk about what that recommendation is, I'm going to highly advise you to take their advice, even though it's going to cost you some money. If you're not working with a competent attorney and you're representing yourself in pro, pro se, this is a step you want to investigate and a step you want to take because the court is likely going to mandate mediation. What that means is you sitting across the table from your soon-to-be ex-spouse and or their legal counsel with a mediator in the room and going through the process of hashing out what each of you are looking for and trying to find middle ground. And when I went through my divorce in 2001, I was suspicious of the advice my attorney gave me saying, I'm going to set you up, as long as you give me permission to do so, I'm going to set you up with a mediation counselor. And they're going to sit down with you and they're going to prep you for mediation. And I thought to myself, why do I need a you know, consultant? Why do I have to pay, I don't even remember what it was, but it was several thousand dollars. Why do I need to spend that much money with a person? And oh my gosh, am I glad that I did. 
because you may consider this to be the opportunity to really voice your dissension to whatever your spouse is saying. You might want to, you know, interrupt her when she's saying something, interrupt him when he's saying something and say, she's a liar and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? What they're going to teach you is invaluable. When you sit down with a the mediator, they're looking for reasonability. They're looking for someone to act in the best interest of the household, who truly cares that as this marriage splits apart, both parties have a chance to start their new life successfully. Someone who's transparent, someone that's open, someone that's of a good demeanor, not accusatory, not yelling and screaming. You might think that this is a great opportunity to get into that battle because since the initial filing, you're probably separated from your spouse. You probably haven't seen him for a while. Now you're sitting across the table and that husband of yours is making all these defamatory statements about you. And you think to yourself, I need to pound the fist and you know, prove that this is a big lie. You don't want to do that. You have to be reasonable. So they will coach and counsel you on what that mediator is looking for. Because remember, the mediator's job is twofold. Number one, it's to try to find middle ground and to gain agreement from both sides. But number two, they are an advisor to the court. They are going to <laughs> candidly report on the dynamics of your relationship, what they observe about each of you. So you want to present yourself of good character. You want to present yourself uh, in the context of reasonability, someone who is willing to, you know, hear out the other side. Now, certainly you want to stand up for yourself, but rather than pounding the table and screaming, he's a liar, you have the opportunity to say, that's just not true. And let me tell you why it's not true. In that kind of voice, with that kind of demeanor, and they will skill practice through with you. They will test some of the answers that you're asked for in that mediation and give you a chance to parrot it back and practice it. It is super critical because, again, all the facts that are gathered, all those documents that I talked about a moment ago, this mediation session, they are character assessments. Do you want the court to hear from the mediator that, this person was wild and uncontrollable, and the two got into a fighting, spitting match, and I almost thought it was going to come to blows and I had to break it up. Or do you want the court to hear, these two people, while they have differences, are committed to amicably working through this situation. They didn't reach consensus on, you know, how to best approach this and how to best resolve this, but they were open-minded to each other's sides. Yes, there were some times when they disagreed with each other. Yes, there were some accusations made that one or the other spouse disagreed with and stated so. But I found them to be cooperative, uh, malleable, reasonable in their approach. And I think they will be for you as well, Your Honor. How do you think that resonates with a judge? Take the two extremes. extremes. <laughs> a screaming match between two people or an adult, reasonable conversation, trying to find a middle ground together. And even if that middle ground is not achieved, just showing the willingness to reach that middle ground in the best interest of the family is really music to a uh, family court judge's ears. So please, if you don't have an attorney, if you're representing yourself in pro se, do take the step of researching and finding a mediation coach, a family court certified mediation coach, reach out and have some conversations with them in prep for that mediation session. Do not by any stretch of the imagination go in unprepared. Maybe there are other YouTube videos you can watch. Maybe there are other things you can learn that negate the need for that mediation expert. In my opinion, it's money well spent. That's up to you. If you've engaged an attorney and they haven't yet given you this kind of advice, perhaps it's on the horizon, but it never hurts to say to them, hey, I have been learning about you know, how to approach this and I've heard that having a, a mediation consultant 
may make sense. How do you feel about it? Do you think it's necessary? Um, I can't underscore the importance of this as it relates to those temporary orders. So again, I wanted to share that with you. Part four of this equation, each of you will be asked if you are um, dissolving a marriage that involves children, you're gonna be asked to submit temporary parenting plans. And this includes um, proposed temporary custody arrangements. Who will the children live with? When will they live with them? And how many days per week will they live with them? Remembering that the court's go-to guideline is what they term as what's in the best interest of the children. And in most cases, wherever possible, in the best interest of the children is interpreted to be a shared custody arrangement, 50-50 between parents. It may be three days on, four days off. It may be one week on, one week off. Whatever that may look like, the court is going to default towards that unless there's reasons not to. So what are some of those reasons? If you um, say you're the wife in the equation and you're the breadwinner and you have an executive role that requires travel and you've been gone 70% of the time, you're home on the weekends, the court is going to take that into consideration. They're going to look at who is the primary caregiver, who is the most emotionally supportive in this equation, who went to school plays the most, who attended parent-teacher conferences the most, they're going to weigh that into the equation, which could potentially skew those temporary orders in favor of the parent who has had the most time with the children. Just know that going in. But wherever possible, what they prefer is 50-50. So they may say to you, if you've been traveling 70% of the time and home on the weekends, the court may want to know, can you modify your schedule such that you can be more involved with the children than you have been already. And unless there is something negating in your history, history of documented abuse, problems in the marriage, whatever that may be, unless there's some, a mitigating factor that prevents you from being a viable 50-50 co-parent, the court is going to try to move you in that direction. Which, let's set aside financial implications for a moment. Let's just talk about the children. That is, in fact, what's best for the children. If you have two willing co-parents who agree to dedicate the time necessary to really be there for their children, to help them through this transition from a family unit to two separate families, that is clearly best for the children, for their emotional development, for who they become as adults, for how they view marriages, for how they understand how people can have differences in life but work together for a common goal, even after the marriage separates, yeah, that is in the best interest of the children. But what can happen in a divorce situation is parents can get possessive. They can say, I'm the better parent, and he's this or she's that, and therefore they shouldn't be. And this is what causes all the after-temporary order fights to occur all the accusations to say, no, court, you got it wrong, and here's why, and he's this, and he's that, and she's this, and she's that. And guess what? All that stuff costs time, emotion, and definitely there's a financial implication to it. So really, really do some soul searching around how you'd like to structure those temporary orders. Be accepting of the fact that the court expects you to co-parent wherever possible. Listen, you know, Folks struggle with addiction, and sometimes that takes shape in a marriage and makes them temporarily irresponsible. If that's the case in your situation, it may be that the other parent um, that you suggest while you heal yourself and while you overcome these addictions, that you become less of a co-parent with the understanding that with proof of, you know, successfully overcoming these things, you'd like to be more involved in the future. That's okay. The court wants that level of transparency and honesty. So really do some soul searching about where you're at in your life, how much of your time you can really give to your children, be involved in their lives, be a part of their lives. Look at your travel, look at the demands of your job, 
or whatever role you might hold, and make sure that you've got the bandwidth to do the right thing for your children if there are children involved. Weigh all of that carefully before you submit your temporary request. Let me start by saying I don't want you to think of temporary orders as temporary because in fact in most cases they're not. Although the lead up to the fact finding the court may decide to do along the way, the financial disclosures, the meetings that may occur between that initial hearing and the temporary order um, are not as in-depth as when the temporary orders are contested. In most cases, those temporary orders stand, and it's very difficult to move the court from those temporary orders into something that evolves past them. And there has to be sound reasons, you know, sound evidence. Things have to come out after the fact if it's contested to make the court form the opinion that perhaps they need to make some modifications. What I'm saying to you differently is this. Expect the temporary orders to be the orders. Everything you do from the initial filing to initial hearing to temporary orders is very likely going to dictate everything from the amount of alimony paid, whether it be from the husband to the wife or the wife to the husband, the amount of child support paid, most importantly, the amount of time spent with the children if there are children involved, all those things are decided initially in the temporary orders, and it's only if those orders are contested and the basis for that contestation is sound enough to bring the court away from that initial opinion, opinion into modification of orders. It's only if that occurs that changes are made to the temporary order um, in most cases. So you got to take this part of the game very, very seriously because it can, in fact, be permanent. Um, so I want to make sure that definition is really locked into your mind. Temporary orders, in most cases, likely are not temporary. Now, as I mentioned in the onset, there may, in fact, be mitigating circumstances. Right, so if there's an accusation of abuse, that's going to be investigated prior to the temporary hearings, uh, temporary orders being issued, excuse me. If there are suspicions of drug and alcohol abuse um, as they relate to the marriage and as they relate to the interactions with children, the court may order drug tests, alcohol tests. They may do social in, in, uh, investigations. There could be a family court services um, specialist that sits down with the children prior to temporary hearings. There could be a social worker who comes out to the home and takes a look at the home and or homes if you've separated. Depending on the nature of the accusations leveled in that first phase of affidavits and discovery and disclosure, depending on what's in those and what the mediator hears in that fourth step, the court may take some additional investigatory actions. Um, remember that in the initial hearing, there have been very temporary orders issued. There have been child support, alimony guidelines put in place just until the temporary hearing. And as long as it takes to go through that investigation, the court will take that time and they will weigh in the facts and the data and the information gathered before making those temporary orders. And that's why I say to you, the court does this on a daily, right? They're not, you know, <laughs> inexperienced rookies in divorce situations. So they know what to look for. They know what they hear and read to say to them, we need to dig a little bit further. And if they feel that that's necessary, they will absolutely take those steps. Because in most cases, as I've stated, and I'll state again, the temporary orders are likely to stand. They may be contested. It may lead to an ugly, bloody battle that lasts years. But those temporary orders are likely to stand. Um, unless there's a basis to change them. So the court will take their time, they'll do their investigations, um, which will lead to a hearing on the temporary orders. And if parties can't agree on temporary arrangements, 
the court will decide for you. Both parties having presented all their affidavits, their financial records, their witness testimony, the judge may ask questions, the judge may hear arguments back and forth, um, but at the end of it all, they're going to issue their temporary orders. Now, from personal experience, I can underscore how important this hearing is, because initially, I was the breadwinner, my former wife was not. She had a nascent cash-based uh, business training horses, and whether or not she disclosed all her income, I'm not going to go there, but clearly there, there was disparity in income. Um, she pursued having full custody uh, of the children, frankly, without the right basis to do so. And my attorney stood up and said, I don't want to hear status quo down the road. This is a father who's clearly demonstrated that the accusations that his former wife made are not true. He brought receipts to court. He showed that this was an accusation that shouldn't have been made. He's shown where he can adapt his work um, hours to accommodate you know, shared parenting, 50% custody. He's demonstrated a willingness. The school records he submitted have showed he's been active and involved in their lives, helped them with homework. Um, there's no incident reports. There's nothing in the history that would suggest otherwise. I don't want to hear status quo down the road. I don't want these temporary orders to be skewed in favor of the wife in this equation. If my client is asking for 50% custody and there's a basis to do so, and because she stood up and made that argument in the way that she did, I was awarded 50% custody. Now, it was contested, and this went on for over three years. I'm not going to share a lot of my story. I'm going to intermingle the story of others in future episodes. But I do want you to know that it is critical that you or your attorney stand up for yourself in this equation. There may be accusations thrown, but unless there's a basis behind those accusations, all the investigations that the court does prior to having this hearing, asking their questions, hearing arguments from both sides, and making their determination are likely going to be what it is um, <laughs> for a, a long, long time. Um, so once the judge makes their decisions, they're going to issue the orders. And those remain in effect whether next steps are taken or not, those are the orders, and things move forward from there. Now, if there are filings beyond that, that's when the court gets more deeply involved. And I'm going to talk in future episodes about what that can all look like um, so that you level set on expectations. Um, but after these orders are issued, compliance is not voluntary. It is expected. It is mandatory and it is assessed on an ongoing basis. Unless there are mitigating circumstances like job loss, like health issues, which a party can file a motion and have amendments made, um, there are some pretty steep consequences to not following those temporary orders. Essentially, when and if you can agree, even before mediation, even before an initial court hearing, if you and your spouse can sit down and reasonably agree on a path, then you've made a decision. You've empowered each other. When you can't, you are granting the court's right to make that decision for you. And their decisions are long-lasting and final. They are <laughs> not subject to your whims. You have to comply. And if you don't uh, uh, comply, there are very serious consequences on the other side of that. So know that the best course of action is to solve this before ever going into family court, to reach a reasonable agreement together that you can both live with long term, knowing that if circumstances change, you can always go to court in the future. You can always change things in the future. But saving yourself the headache and heartache, and most importantly, giving yourself permission and the ability to both be in charge of your future. Imagine how empowering that can be as you start your new life, knowing that you both gave yourself the gift of being in control of your circumstances or 
as working as adults together to share a common goal of separating the household, starting new lives, helping the children if applicable through this transition. So I appreciate you joining me, appreciate you staying through the end of the episode. This, again, could be the most important one I record as it relates to the Divorce Board series, uh, War series, excuse me. I would like you to, if you got something from this, please add something to the comments. If you have questions, please ask them. I'm here to help. Remember, I'm not an attorney. This does not constitute legal advice. This is experiential and awareness raising in nature, and that's my intent. I hope if you haven't done so already, you click the like button. It helps with the algorithms. It helps others find this content who really need to hear it. I hope you'll subscribe because my channel is dedicated to many things. Um, Cybersecurity threats are on the rise exponentially. Knowing what the threat horizon looks like, knowing how to, more importantly, protect yourself from these threats is important. Um, and my channel is dedicated to scams, misinformation, and now adding the topic of navigating the complex and dangerous minefield of divorce. Um, so thank you for tuning in. My name is Philip Macko. I'm a five-time published author and, of course, the host of the Muddy Waters podcast and YouTube series. I want to thank you for joining me. I hope you'll join me in future episodes. Now go out and make today a meaningful day. Do something that matters to you and touch the life of another if you can. That's what we're all here to do together. So thank you again for joining, and I hope to see you in a future episode.